thought that today it would be nice to read a short story, one of my more recent ones from this anthology called Love After the End. And this is actually an anthology of two-spirit and indigiqueer speculative fiction uh, edited by Joshua Whitehead. So this is like really cool. It's uh, the successor to the anthology that had my chihuahuas in space story. Um, but for this one, I went a little bit more creepy. I think a recent review called it creepy, which I was going for. So that's good. Uh, and it's actually the story of a, a, a young teenager who is kidnapped by a floating city. Um, so I probably won't get through the whole thing, but just to let you know, there's some twists <laughs> and turns and all that. <laughs> Dear Bottle Finder, please deliver this letter to CC. They live with our parents on the western shores of New Houston. Our house sits on blue stilts and is surrounded by rose bushes. Mom used to keep them well trimmed and blooming. I hope she still does. CC, I'm sorry, I never meant to disappear. Thing is, I made a mistake during your birthday party. It happened after lunch when y'all were playing beach croquet. Remember how bad I was always hitting the wooden ball too hard and launching it into the water? That embarrassed me so much. I pretended to need a bathroom break and scuttled to the far end of the cove. There I was alone, except for a couple of gills fighting over a dead crab. The isolation didn't make me nervous. Didn't surprise me either, since that area is unpleasant, with sharp pebbles outnumbering fine grains of sand. Even though I was wearing shoes, I could feel points digging into the bottoms of my feet. As I knelt to look for pretty shells between the rocks, I got distracted by an intense flash of light on the ocean, the sun reflecting off something silver bobbing in the shallows. Curious me decided to have a closer look. Nearby granite boulders, the remnants of a pre-collapsed seawall that had been torn apart and scattered by the sea, jutted from the land. Some were above the high tide line and others were halfway submerged in the water. I climbed onto the nearest boulder and jumped from rock to rock till I was several meters away from land, balanced on the peak of a snail-crusted rock that was almost totally underwater. From my lookout point, I recognized the silver object as a small boat. It was shaped like a double-wide canoe with a flat deck. I didn't see any sign of a human pilot. There was a hatch on the deck that could have led to an inner area. It bobbed closer, and its pointed head turned towards me like the needle of a compass. I heard the high-pitched voice of a child call in English. Hello? Come here. I shouted back, do you need help? Yes, please help me. I consider returning to the party and telling everyone about the boat. Remember that mistake I mentioned earlier? Yeah, I decided to handle the situation alone. From my boulder perch, I leaned onto the flat stern of the boat. It didn't rock much as if stabilized by an inner weight or mechanism. The hatch swung outward with a creak when I pulled on its lever. The voice called to me from inside the dark interior. Help me. They sounded so desperate. The boat was much deeper than I'd expected as most of its volume was hidden underwater like an iceberg. Did you learn about those? They used, there used to be ice in the Atlantic. A ladder led from the hatch to the bottom of the boat, but I didn't notice it because canoes, even big ones, should be shallow belly, and crawled in head first. I fell at least two meters before hitting the hard metal floor with my shoulder. Could have been worse, but the impact start, smarted like a barbed thorn. And by the time I stopped cursing, the boat was already moving, vibrating with the hum of a quiet motor. I couldn't see anything. The hatch had slammed shut behind me and there were no sources of light inside. By swinging my hands side to side, I found the first ladder rung and climbed until I felt the hatch lever. It was locked. I beat my fists against the metal door and screamed for you, for mom and dad, and for all of our cousins and uncles and aunts and grandparents. I even screamed for your annoying friend Webster since I knew he liked to swim and might hear my voice. When that didn't work, I crawled around the boat, searching in the darkness for the child who had called for me. There was no child, although I bumped into a console near the bow. The bow, <laughs> not the bow. <laughs> I pressed every button or switch I could feel, at one point even turning something shaped like a steering wheel. Nothing stopped the boat or freed me from my imprisonment. At that point, there was a crackle of static, the kind emitted by a radios. Speakers over my head chided me in the same high-pitched voice that had lured me aboard. Stop messing around. If you break the ship, you'll get stranded and die in the middle of nowhere. 
I can't see, I said. Let me out of this place. The lights turned out, she replied, but shuttle A3 is otherwise in top shape. Don't worry. My city's nearby. Just sit tight for a couple of hours. What city, I asked. Am I being abducted? Absolutely not. You're being rescued. From what? My sibling's birthday party? Take me home right now. Why do you want to return to that? Humans aren't animals. You're meant for more than survival. You can be a vessel for millennia of culture, art, literature, science, leisure, hobbies, and joy. I don't know what that's, what that's supposed to mean, I said. When it comes to culture and joy, I'm good. Can I talk to an adult now, please? You are. The shrill voice of my captor dropped in pitch, no longer a cutesy toddle, toddler shrill. That's when I screamed. Hours later, just two hours according to my captor, but it felt like a lot more. The hole encasing me shuddered once, and then the motor shut off. With a click, the exit hatch popped open. The dim yellow light that spilled into my prison was artificial. When I climbed the ladder and peeked outside, I saw six gray walls and no sky. I was in some kind of landing bay. A glass encased security camera overhead swiveled until its robotic eye looked down in my upturned face. There were no other signs of movement except for the gentle rocking. Everything swayed side to side. That's how I knew that the little canoe had taken me to a bigger ship a city floating in the gulf. Hey, I shouted, anyone here? The voice responded from hidden speakers in every wall. I felt like I was drowning in her frequency. Don't worry, she said, you're never alone anymore. What's your name? I lied because true lames don't belong in the mouth of danger. Mona Lisa, I said, what's yours? Olivia, can you say Olivia? Olivia. No, not Olivia, it's Olivia. Your accent is so weird. Her accent was the weird one. She spoke in an old timey person from the 22nd century. I didn't talk back though. At that moment, my only goal was escape. Unfortunately, it seemed like Olivia had complete control over the floating city. She unlocked the door that conducted the landing bay to a white corridor. The walls were covered with continuous thin transparent screens. They resembled a touch sensitive digital screen instructor Lee used in math class. His screens were just half meter wide though, big enough to show us what an isosceles triangle looks like, but not large enough to swallow us whole. Olivia directed me through a series of corridors and doorways. Dim yellow lights lit the path and went dark the moment I passed them. She gushed about the perks of the floating city, VR game rooms, saunas, movies projected on vast screens, and hundreds of cabins filled with the personal treasures of the founders of New America. Did you say New America, I asked? No way, when was this city launched? 203 years ago, she said. You missed our bicentennial. It's when I understood. I'd been stolen away by a shuttle to the remnants of a doomsday city. I learned about doomsday cities from friends, not in history class. To celebrate the first day of summer, Morgan, Jesse, Pete, and I were telling scary stories around a campfire. And Jesse went, hey, want to hear something creepy? You know that guy, he'll stretch the truth like taffy for attention. Guess that's why I used to assume doomsday cities were fake. Well, a broken clock is right twice a day and life is sometimes so weird it doesn't need to be embellished by Jesse. The story goes, centuries ago, people were more likely to prepare for the end of the world than attempt to save it. A group of rich folks decide to build floating cities and live in the middle of the ocean, far away from the land's troubles. Two cities were launched into the Atlantic. One sank and killed everyone on board. The other, New America, disappeared. Some claim that it's still out there, hiding, dying. A few people remain alive, but their numbers aren't great enough to keep the city running. Others say that the city itself, equipped with advanced AI, is lonely. What happened to everyone, I asked Olivia. Are they all dead? 200 years had passed, but the founders could have descendants or been medical immortals. It was old-timey people who invested fortunes in anti-aging therapies and tech. I'm still here, Olivia said. Where, I asked, all I've heard is your voice. The control center. She was quiet for a couple of minutes, a long period of time for Olivia. I'm the ship, Mona Lisa, she said, which means I'm more intelligent than a human. Under different circumstances, I might have laughed. Yeah, AI used to be different before the collapse, mimicking sentience so well, people would converts with their own phones. But Olivia had a personality. That meant the ship was more complex than any tech I'd known. Human minds rarely did well in solitary confinement. What about human-like minds? I stopped walking at a fork in the corridor. 
Go right, Olivia said. I hesitated because my internal compass screams, you've been here before. Are you sure? Just did do what I tell you, Mona Lisa. Obviously, I'm sure. I wanted to trust myself. There's a reason why mom always makes me her navigator when we travel, but I've never had to navigate through a monotonous web of ship corridors. Why would Olivia send me in circles? At the time, I had no answer for that question, so I continued walking. In between directions, Olivia described the city rules. If a door is locked, I want it locked to keep you safe. Our high voltage security system doesn't know the difference between a Mona Lisa and an intruder. Do you got it? Intruders, I asked, so we aren't the only two here? I never said that. There are pirates on the sea and my deck cameras might malfunction, which reminds me you aren't allowed to go outside. It's for your own safety. Stay in your bedroom between sundown and sunup. Morning and afternoon are for chores, and you could study after supper. I asked, what will I eat? I'd been too frightened and vaguely nauseous on the ship to notice my empty belly, but hunger made every step feel like two. There's plenty of food, she promised. And water, I asked. Of course, she laughed at me. The founders didn't build a whole city without considering basic human necessities. Then why aren't they here anymore? For the second time that day, she did not answer my question. Instead, Olivia tersely said, up those stairs. I soon entered a corridor that had evenly spaced doors along one wall. They were numbered 201 to 215 with brass plates. Olivia said, yours is lucky seven. And then when I opened door 207, she added, welcome home. My cabin had three rooms, a bedroom, lounge, and bathroom, and was larger than her house. It resembled a history museum or time capsule. The furniture, a long brown sofa, metal coffee table, four poster bed and several cabinets were fixed to the faux wood floor. I could tell it was faux because the grain patterns on the planks repeated over and over again, lacking the originality of a real sliced tree. The walls in the bedroom and lounge were bright white and coated with the same kind of screen I noticed in the hall. The bedroom cabinet was packed with musty dresses and narrow slippers. Cabinets contained empty glass bottles and a variety of little gadgets like binoculars and a music box filled with gold chains. I only peeked at that stuff since it most likely belonged to a dead person. And I felt like an intruder in a grave. Olivia, who used to year live here, I asked, but she was not in a mood to chat and the door locked behind me. It's when it really sunk in that I was trapped in an artifact with a cruel streak. I ran to the nearest porthole and pressed my face against the cool glass, didn't see any land, just calm black water and a cloudy night sky. I wrestled the porthole open, ignoring its squeaky hinges, which were like nails on a chalkboard, and leaned out as far as I could. Up to my shoulders, honestly, CC, if the window had been wider, I might have leapt into the Atlantic in a hopeless attempt to swim home, because that's how fox in a snare desperate I felt. I stood like that and stared at the vague horizon until the ocean wind twisted my hair into a waist net length knot of salty tangles. And I was gonna stop here to check for time. I could leave it at that if we're, if we're good.